I loved my wife. But she deserved what she had coming. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today, we're looking at 20 times people confessed to crimes on camera. There is no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. For this list, we'll be looking at the most infamous people whose despicable confessions were caught on tape. Which of these cases sends chills down your spine? Let us know in the comments. Mark Castellano. I feel dead inside already. Mark Castellano shared an apartment in Houston, Texas with his ex-girlfriend Michelle Warner and their young son Caden. In September 2012, the former couple got into a heated argument that ended in Warner's death at Castellano's hands. I come home, um, she's in her room. The first thing she does is start yelling at me that the Caden has made a big mess. The 31-year-old mother was reported missing by her family and all eyes soon turned to Castellano as the suspect. As the case gained traction, Castellano sat for an interview with Dr. Phil, in which he insisted that Warner had left the apartment after the argument and never returned. Did she just walk away from the apartment, you think? I'm sure someone picked her up. She doesn't walk anywhere. So you think she called somebody to come get her? She had to. Just days later, however, Castellano turned himself in and owned up to the crime in a taped interrogation with the police. I came back, I just got rid of her. Where did you get rid of her? He was later found guilty of Warner's murder and sentenced to 27 years in prison. Can't live with this anymore either, man. I know. I know. I wanted to tell Dr. Phil, but... Natavia Lowry. The 2007 murder of celebrity realtor and former music manager Linda Stein in her Manhattan apartment soon became the subject of a media frenzy. Upon close investigation, authorities narrowed in on Stein's personal assistant, Natavia Lowry, who was reported to have had a strained relationship with her boss. Why am I here? Like, what's going on? How did I get to this point? You know, I'm asking myself that. In her interrogation, Lowry seemingly confessed to her role in Stein's murder, claiming that the real estate broker had provoked her by blowing smoke in her face and uttering racially insensitive remarks. And, you know, her screaming and yelling, I just snatched it from her. So I took it and it's like, I just hit her with it. Apparently, Lowry had stolen $30,000 from Stein and likely killed her when she was confronted about it. Although she later recanted her confession, Lowry was convicted and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. I felt bad. I felt sorry. Jordy Brooke. In November of 2014, Peter Steer, an Australian cameraman for Seven News, was sent to the coastal town of Noosa Heads in Queensland to cover a shooting. On his way there, he was hailed down by a man on a motorbike named Jordy Brook, who disclosed that he was the perpetrator of the incident in question. Steer then called the authorities as he filmed Brook making a teary confession to the crime. Hey, don't be silly. Don't be silly. While waiting for police, Brook had a change of heart and stole the cameraman's car at gunpoint. He was eventually arrested after crashing into a gas station and brought up on multiple charges, including attempted murder and armed robbery. And he just walked up to me purposefully, uh, looked me in the eyes and asked me for a cigarette lighter. Jared Murray. Jared Murray and Gennaro Sanchez were both freshmen at East Central University in Oklahoma in 2012. On December 5th, Murray lured Sanchez into driving him to a Walmart by offering to pay him $20. Uh, he panicked. Uh, went to pull out his phone, I yanked the phone out of his hand, and then he panicked some more, kept telling me not to kill him. This would be Sanchez's last ride, as he was gunned down by Murray in his own car. Kept telling me not to kill him. To make him feel more comfortable, I unloaded the clip, unloaded the bullet from the chamber, handed them over to him, and that eased his nerves. Murray fled the scene, but was eventually arrested while attempting to hitchhike to Canada. During police interrogation, Murray quickly owned up to the crime giving a chilling confession seemingly devoid of any remorse. Uh, shot once, missed. Shot a second time, hit. He was driving 10, 15 miles an hour, so it was rather slow. He admitted to planning the murder weeks ahead and believed he deserved the death penalty. Death sentence, sir. And why do you think he deserved the death sentence? An eye for an eye, sir. Instead, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity and remanded to a mental health facility. Christian Romero. Even before he became a teenager, Christian Romero had already committed murder. In November of 2008, Romero shot and killed his father Vincent and their tenant, Timothy Romans, after they got home from work. The crimes baffled investigators, who examined a bunch of other suspects before confronting the inevitable truth. 
Initially, Romero had stated that he returned home from school to find both men already dead. Oh, on the ground. Um, However, when police questioned him further, he admitted to committing the murders himself. In a deal with the prosecution, Romero pleaded guilty to the negligent homicide of Romans, but was spared from being charged with the death of his father. He was first committed to a treatment facility indefinitely, but gained his freedom when he turned 18. Russell Williams A woman was at home alone when she was surprised by a male intruder. She said he blindfolded her tied her up. Having served in the Canadian Air Force for 23 years, Russell Williams rose to the rank of colonel and was commander of the largest military air base in Canada. In February 2010, Williams was linked to the assault and murder of Jessica Lloyd through the tire tracks found outside her home. Williams was informed the distinctive tires of his SUV matched the tracks in the field next to Jessica Lloyd's house. He was taken in for questioning and eventually broke confessing to not only Lloyd's murder, but also to other assaults and burglaries in the area. Where am I going on, the, uh, on here to get to her? In this block here. Okay. So you're pointing to a detailed map of that area and I'll show you where she is. Williams forcefully entered women's homes, not to steal any valuables, but to collect their underwear, which he would then wear and take pictures of himself in. He was tried on multiple charges, including murder, assault, and 82 counts of breaking and entering, resulting in a life sentence. That's an involuntary reaction, we call. But that's indicative of what's going on internally. And what he's nodding to is, holy shit, it's my boot. Earl Valentine. And I don't feel no motherfucking remorse for what I did. While many individuals have confessed to their crimes in interviews or during police interrogations, Earl Valentine basically bragged about his on Facebook. She lied on me, had warrants taken out on me. She drugged me all the way down to nothing. In an eerie live stream in September 2016, Valentine admitted to shooting his ex-wife Keisha and their son Earl Jr. Keisha had moved to Norlina, North Carolina with Earl Jr. in an attempt to escape Valentine after her restraining order against him had expired. In the video, Valentine accused his ex-wife of trying to tarnish his image and claims to have shot her in retribution. I loved my wife, but she deserved what she had coming. Police later tracked down Valentine to a motel in Columbia, South Carolina, but found that he had already taken his own life. We're pretty angry about it, um, and especially uh, because the way he's acting over it. Daniel Wozniak. And you will be my true. A community theater actor in Costa Mesa, California, Daniel Wozniak was arrested in May 2010 after the body of Julie Kibuishi was discovered in his neighbor Sam Hare's apartment. At the time, police were on the hunt for Hare, who was presumed to have fled after ending Kibuishi's life. He's like, I shot somebody. I was not happy about it. It was a fit of rage, and honestly, she had it coming. While in police custody, Wozniak initially denied having anything to do with the crime. So I'm saying there. Absolutely. You're arrested for murder. But after a few hours of questioning, he eventually confessed to killing Kibuishi and Hare, who was a war veteran in a bid to collect his combat pay savings. I'm crazy and I did it. You did what? I killed Julie and I killed Sam. In 2016, Wozniak was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and handed the death penalty. Israel Keys. To describe Israel Keys as terrifying will be quite an understatement. There is no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. The Utah-born serial killer orchestrated multiple carefully planned murders across several states in the United States. After kidnapping and killing his last confirmed victim, Samantha Koenig, Keyes was arrested in Alaska when he tried withdrawing money from an ATM with her debit card. While in police custody, Keyes chillingly described his crimes, although leaving out just enough detail to avoid being directly linked with any confirmed case. When I was smart, I would let them come to me. Just remote area. Still, he confessed to the murders of Koenig and a middle-aged couple named Bill and Lorraine Courier. You might not get exactly what you're not as much to choose from in a manner of speaking, but there's also no witnesses really. There's no deals around. Prosecutors were still putting their case against Keys together when he took his own life in his jail cell. Steve Stevens. 
37-year-old Steve Stevens became the subject of an extensive police manhunt in April 2017, when he uploaded a video to Facebook which showed him committing a murder. In the clip, recorded on his phone, Stevens randomly stops Robert Godwin, an elderly man walking down the street, who he briefly talks to before fatally shooting him. Can you say Joy Lane? Joy Lane? Yeah. The crime was reportedly motivated by problems Stevens was having with his girlfriend at the time. That same day, he uploaded another video in which he also admitted to killing more people, although those claims were not verified by police. Two days later, Stevens was spotted at a McDonald's drive through but ended up taking his own life before police could arrest him. We told him he was waiting on his fries for a minute just to kind of buy some time for the cops if it actually was him. And uh, he said he had no time to wait, he had to go. And at that point, he took his chicken McNuggets and left. Melissa Miller. She started at the beginning. Okay, let me take a couple of breaths. In February of 2013, colleagues of Annie Meyer filed a missing persons report after she was absent from work for several days. Over the next few months, police questioned those who were close to Meyer, but found it difficult to gain any substantial information from her roommate and former partner, Melissa Miller. Our Colorado mountains create a perfect burial ground until the snow melts. It wasn't until July, when Meyer's remains were found, that Miller decided to cooperate with police. In her taped interview with investigators, Miller painted a relationship with Meyer that was fraught with tension due to money problems. She then confessed to killing her while they were on a hike in the Colorado mountains. She poked at me and I just turned with the walking stick. That's my action and hit her. After pleading guilty to second-degree murder, Miller was sentenced to 20 years in prison. In court today, Melissa Miller is already making plans to see her friends and family next. Howard. Sean Vincent Gillis. The word monster come to mind. The crimes of Sean Vincent Gillis were so despicable that even he referred to himself as pure evil. Over a 10-year period, Gillis claimed the lives of eight women in and around the Baton Rouge area in Louisiana. Dubbed the Other Baton Rouge Killer, he was known to perform disturbing acts on the bodies of his victims. What kind of tools did you bring with you for the monster brain? In case it was a fishing knife. In 2004, he was arrested and charged with three murders and ended up confessing to all three plus an additional five. Gillis went into detail about how he would hunt down his victims and the gruesome ways he ended their lives. There was a piece, there was a pipe on the ground, not even a pipe, it was like a steel rod, mm -hmm. kind of like rebar but smoother. He was, however, only convicted of the initial three murders and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. David Tarloff. David Tarloff had struggled with mental illness from at least his early 20s. In 1991, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia by a psychiatrist named Kent Schinbach, who recommended his involuntary commitment to a psychiatric facility. I didn't go there. All I wanted was to get money from him. Fast forward to 2008. Tarloff visited Schinbach's office once again, only this time his goal was to rob the doctor and use his money to care for his ailing mother. Instead, Tarloff ended up killing Catherine Fahey, another psychiatrist who shared an office with Schinbach in what he claimed was self-defense. Police traced fingerprints from the crime to Tarloff, who rambled his way through a confession when questioned. I believe he was going to be there. I went to it because I heard a noise and I just wanted to go in and look. She attacked me. Everything happened so fast. Following two mistrials, he was eventually convicted and handed a life sentence in 2014. Mark Chopper Reed. One of the most notorious criminals in Australian history, Mark Chopper Reed, had a long rap sheet that included crimes like armed robbery, kidnapping, and arson. And you stand back and you got smash to the back of the head. Reed's notorious activities led to him spending a large chunk of his adult life incarcerated. While in prison, the infamous gangster contracted hepatitis C and was diagnosed with liver cancer years later. Put your hand up. Run this one. Yeah, he packed it up and he went like that. Just before his death. Reed sat for a televised interview with 60 Minutes Australia, where he admitted to having been responsible for the deaths of four people. What was your involvement in his murder? I was just a bloke that killed him. Perhaps the most shocking thing about the interview, which was granted just 16 days before his death, was the casual nature with which Reed described his graphic crimes. The pub's keg cellar became Des Costello's temporary tomb. 
Yeah, and he's gone. <laughs> uh, when you threw, why are you laughing? <laughs> there he goes. Robert Willie Picton. Possibly one of Canada's most prolific serial killers, the crimes of Robert Willie Picton sent shockwaves through the country when they were eventually discovered. <laughs> Picton had inherited a large pig farm from his family and reportedly fed the corpses of his victims to his pigs. In 2002, police stormed Picton's farm on an illegal firearms warrant, but ended up finding personal effects belonging to multiple missing women. He was charged with 26 counts of murder, but in a chilling jail cell surveillance video, Picton confessed to an undercover officer that he had claimed the lives of 49 women and even, quote, wanted one more. For his despicable crimes, Picton was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. Gary Richway. My strategy was to get him talking and to have him do most of the talking. Dubbed the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway terrorized girls and women in the states of Washington and Oregon in the 80s and 90s. While his victim count is believed to be as high as 90, Ridgway was convicted of 49 murders, the second highest number of confirmed killings in U.S. history. Ridgway sat for multiple interviews with authorities, most notably with FBI profiler Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole, in which he confessed to more killings and detailed how he picked up his victims. I'm driving down the road, so I whipped out my ID, and with my ID would be my, I put my finger over my driver's license to hide my name. Throughout these interviews, he owned up to the most murders for any American serial killer. They would know I was a probably normal person. But you were using really him. using your son as part of your ruse. Due to his plea agreement, Ridgway avoided execution and was instead sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ed Kemper. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detectable. I started flaunting that invisibility. A truly disturbing figure, Ed Kemper was responsible for the deaths of 10 people, including his own mother and paternal grandparents. After killing his mother and one of her friends on April 20th, 1973, Kemper called the police and confessed to the crimes. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. Of the 10 murders, Kemper was charged with and convicted of eight, for which he was handed eight consecutive life sentences. And I'm picking up young women, and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. Throughout his life in prison, Kemper granted multiple interviews, such as for the documentary Murder, No Apparent Motive, during which he opened up about his crimes in explicit details. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like him. He was also profiled by agents of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, which was portrayed in the Netflix series Mindhunter. Robert Durst. I am going to go use the restroom, which is right here. The Jinx was a six-part true crime docu-series that aired on HBO in 2015. The critically acclaimed show was centered around real estate tycoon Robert Durst, who at the time was suspected of killing his wife, Kathleen McCormick, and friend Susan Berman. In the final episode, Durst is shown a damning handwritten letter about Berman's murder that seemed to match his writing but he flat out denies being the author. There it is, your court. Then, in what is arguably one of the most shocking moments in TV history, he goes to the bathroom and seemingly confesses to the crimes while his mic is still recording. Kill them all, of course. Durst was later given a life sentence for Berman's death, but he died of cardiac arrest just three months later. The BTK Killer. The BTK Killer was the self-imposed nickname of American serial killer Dennis Rader. After you tied them up, what did they do? Well, uh, they started complaining about uh, being tied up, and I re-loosened re the bonds a couple of times, uh, tried to make Mr. Otero as comfortable as I could. Rader murdered 10 people in the state of Kansas between 1974 and 1991, and sent letters to the authorities bragging about it. He was eventually caught in 2005 after sending police a floppy disk with metadata that revealed his identity. I didn't have a mask on or anything. They already could ID me and uh, uh, made, a, made a decision to go ahead and, and 
put him down, I guess, or strangle him. On the day of his trial, Rader surprised the court by instead pleading guilty to all 10 counts of first-degree murder and vividly recounted how he carried them out. Uh, tied his feet to the uh, bedpost, at the bottom of the bedpost, so he couldn't run. Uh, kind of tied her in the other bedroom. Throughout the chilling, nearly one-hour-long confession, Rader offered no apologies for his actions and was later handed 10 consecutive life sentences. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into settings and switch on your notifications. Ted Bundy. To have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it. You'd be hard pressed to find an American adult who hasn't heard the name Ted Bundy. The infamous serial killer claimed at least 30 lives over a four year period, although that number is believed to be much higher. After he was caught and sentenced to death for three of the murders, Bundy appealed the decision up to the US Supreme Court to no avail. On the eve of his execution, Bundy sat for a taped interview in which he admitted guilt to the crimes and described the true nature of his murderous tendencies. For the record, you are guilty of killing many women and girls. Is yes, that yes, that's true. A few hours later, Bundy's reign of terror came to an end when he was executed in the electric chair on January 24th, 1989. That I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have, and these young women that I have harmed feel.